let's take a closer look at the structure of amines here. So we've seen amines before, and we, of course, we know that there's a lone pair on the nitrogen. So um, amines are sp3 hybridized, and they have a bond angle of about 107. And putting larger groups as substituents causes a little bit more steric repulsion between them, and it increases that angle up to about 108 degrees. So since there's the possibility of having three different groups on this molecule, and a lone pair being a, an additional group, so four different things on nitrogen, we need to take a second and talk about chirality. Now before we do that, we need to take a little look at how resonance factors into the structure of nitrogen. And then that'll lead us nicely into stereochemistry. So if we look at a couple molecules here, we can make some pretty good judgments as to whether or not the nitrogen is sp3 or sp2 hybridized. So let's take a look at this molecule, for example. Now, if you recall from chapter 16, aromaticity, this molecule is aromatic. And that's because we have a cyclic planar structure, we have a conjugated pi system, and we have six electrons that are participating in resonance here. Now, in order to do that, though, we had to make this nitrogen sp2 hybridized. And that makes sense anyway, because we all know that we can do this. Right? So if we come around and draw that as a resonance structure here, we'd end up with this. Right? And then plus others, right? So there's others here. But the point is, is that that nitrogen is sp2 hybridized. So this nitrogen here is planar. So when we consider um, stereochemistry or just maybe the shape of that nitrogen, the hybridization, we have to look at, at resonance. The other case that we're going to see, um, especially in some of the chapters coming up next, chapter 21, are amides. So amides are R groups connected to a carbonyl, and then a nitrogen here, right? And the nitrogen can have two different attachments. So one thing we know is this, is that there is resonance in the structure. So of course we know that that can occur. So the question is, what is the hybridization of that nitrogen? Is it more sp3 or is it more sp2? So this would be our resonance structure here. And then let's just make these H's. All right, now one thing that we know through spectroscopy is that if we just, if we call this HA here, and then this HB, we know that there's not a lot of free rotation here. So these protons stay essentially in the same relative position. And we can tell that by looking at NMR, for example. So remember that that bond that we're talking about here, this bond is the amide bond. Remember we also call it peptide bond. So that's the, the linkage between two amino acids there. And that rigidity provides um, I guess stability to the three-dimensional structures of proteins. So it helps stabilize things like beta pleated sheets and alpha helices and things of that nature. Now this all factors into stereochemistry too. So um, the, the resonance that we're looking at can affect that. Now in order to have something, um, a molecule that has a chiral center, we have to have four different groups. So here, let's look, if the nitrogen has three different groups, right, again, plus the lone pair, so that would be four different things, then it's technically a stereocenter. 
Well, what you may not have noticed up to this point is that we've conveniently eliminated our um, discussion here of chirality when it comes to nitrogen. So if you look back through all the previous chapters, you'll notice that we've kind of just skipped over what about nitrogen. So it turns out that that nitrogen atom does not retain its configuration. So if you look down below here, here are R stereoisomer is in equilibrium with S. And what happens here is that that lone pair does something called nitrogen inversion. So it actually, it's a process called quantum tunneling. And the electrons go through the nucleus and they pop out on the other side of the nitrogen atom. Now, when that happens, you go through this transition state. And the transition state is going to be important for us. So let's just Let's just continue down here. Right? And again, this is at room temperature. So this thing happens hundreds of times per second with six kcals per mole. It's easy to occur at room temperature. So what happens in our transition state is we get something that looks like this. So we have our H atom, our nitrogen, and then we get this planar conformation here, CH2, CH3 and CH3 here. Now what happens around that nitrogen is that becomes sp2 hybridized. So we have a p orbital here and a p orbital here. Right? We kind of have like an electron here. Right? The process is, you can imagine they're starting to, to tunnel down and move that direction essentially. All right, so again to highlight here, that now is sp2, and these are our p orbitals. All right, now the other thing that I want to point out to you that's going to matter soon is remember that that bond angle right here, that bond angle is 120 degrees. So sometimes there's steric restraints that limits us and prohibits us from adopting this 120 degrees. We'll see that in the next couple of pages. So that's our transition state here. And then this comes over to form that. So generally speaking, nitrogen under these circumstances, um, we, we get a mixture of enantiomers, 50-50 essentially. Now, there are some exceptions. So let's just do a little review here down below and talk about them. So what we do is we use the kahn ingold prelog convention, which says that lone pairs have the lowest priority. So when we look at this first molecule, um, this is a case where we have um, a stereocenter. But this one's easy, because really, the stereocenter is here. right? It's not part of the nitrogen. So the first case is amines whose chirality stems from the presence of chiral carbon atoms. Right, so when you go through and you figure out the stereo center of this, that turns out to be an R. Right, so you get one, two, three. So it moves around this direction. So recall that's the S direction, but number four is out. So we have to change our answer to R. The other case is, well, what if you have no lone pair? Well, if there's no lone pair, then there's no such thing as nitrogen inversion because it, we don't have electrons to go through the nucleus. So in this particular structure down below, we're locked into this structure. So we, we're not going to flip-flop here. So looking at this, here's our number four. Right? Bromine would be number one. That side's number two. This side is number three. So we're moving around that direction. Again, that is the S direction. But... Just like we saw before, right? number four is pointing at us, so you have to change your configuration to an R. So this is R. And then the third case where we um, do see chirality is where we have that steric restriction of obtaining that transition state. Right? So here's an example that's from your textbook, it's from your weighted textbook. So when you look at this molecule, um, right, in theory, this bond angle right here is 60 degrees. It turns out to not be exactly 60 because 
the um, orbitals there of that sp3 um, nitrogen actually overlap and bend a little bit more so they're they're not head-on they kind of you know it's kind of like a bent bond a little bit but anyway let's call it 60 for the sake of our argument here so in order to do this inversion remember that we have to go through um, that planar transition state All right so kind of simplifying this down because it's hard to draw here we have our nitrogen right, with three substituents in it and then we have a lone pair here and remember before in order to do that inversion we have to do this right, where we end up having this uh, planar transition state right so that's where we had the electrons like that. So again, getting that bond angle here of 120 is just really tough to do. All right, so um, in this case, the mirror image of this, if we look over to the other side, that's the mirror image. So these two molecules, we can isolate and we can separate them and they don't have, uh, they don't raise some eyes. All right, so again, kind of looking down below, we know sp3 should be about 109. If we call that bond angle about 60 in our ring, right, 109 to 160 gives us this angle strain, and it's not exactly that, it's a little bit less than that, right? But obtaining that sp2 increases that angle strain um, to something that's not manageable. So that's why we can isolate these things. So you just have to watch out for large substituents and or rings that prohibit this nitrogen inversion.